Hello, and we should be live right now. Okay, so welcome everyone to a new Sound of AI conversation uh, episode. So I want to remind you guys that this is an interactive session, so please write all, your, all of your questions directly uh, in the chat. And uh, if you have like any questions, if you have any questions, just like put them like in the comment section. And uh, the host for today is me, of course, but the guest is Josh Hodge, who's the host and director of the Audio Programmer. Welcome, Josh. It's nice to have you here. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here on a, on a channel that's done so many great things for developers and, uh, and, and for the community. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really a pleasure to have you here. So we had like, the possibility to sort of have a conversation on your channel a few months back, I believe, like I was there. And I said like it was such an inspiration for me, like your channel, the audio programmer. And I think like so many people benefited like from uh, your channel. And that's quite amazing. Also the community that you've built, really. Cool. Thank you. It's, it's such a surprise for... Uh... For, for other people, as it has been for me, so I think I'm I think I'm the person that's the most surprised about the success it's had so far. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like uh, you shouldn't be, because uh, I mean the quality there like is quite high. I would say both like tutorials, meetups, and everything. It's quite the great formula, I would say, right? But Josh, can you just like tell us a little bit more about uh, your background? So where do you come from? Yeah, so I have. An unusual background. I, uh, I originally came from Pennsylvania, which is here in the U.S., and I grew up here, so I'm American, born and raised. Uh, when I uh, when I uh, turned 18, I'd actually joined the U.S. Air Force. Uh, and oh, I did wow. counseling for the U.S. Air Force. Uh, so I have a background in mental health, and counseling, and uh, psychology, and I did that for a while. And during that time, I had got stationed in England. Uh, so that's what introduced me to uh, the European way of life. Uh, I, uh, I got out of the Air Force, and I was doing DJing as a second job Okay. While, during my time in the Air Force. But then I, uh, I got more serious about that and uh, got a lot of opportunities. So I did a lot of traveling around the world, DJing and touring. Uh, that got me into music production, to learn how to produce my own music. Uh, and um, so I did that full time for about 10 years. And then I, uh, I used uh, a grant that was given to me from my time in the service to go back to university uh, where I studied uh, audio programming. Yeah, at Goldsmiths University in London. That's so, cool. And wh when was that? So, so that so that was in London uh, at, at Goldsmiths University. Oh, that's cool. And and w which year was that? So that was from that was from 2015 to 2018. So uh, right. Not not so. That's cool. That's cool. So it's nice like that you have this sort of like very uh, varied uh, background and coming from like mental health, like having like your, I mean, journey in the army. It's, it's quite a typical, like I would say, but probably like what moved you like in the end was like this passion towards uh, like music and programming, right? So, and then doing like the, your degree, like Goldsmiths, right? So, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah please go ahead. I went to Goldsmiths. Yeah, before I went to Goldsmiths, I had actually never written a line of code. code. So oh, that's cool. When I when I jumped into it, when I jumped into it, I didn't actually uh, know what it was going to be like or if I was going to like it at all. I just wanted to try something different with my life. And um, yeah, luckily, luckily it's worked out so far. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> life is interesting because what happens is that. It seems that these things from the past, like the mental, the, the mental health or the music production background and the DJing background, all became contributors to all the things that I ended up 
doing with the audio program and building the community there. Yeah, speaking of which, can you define what's the audio programmer? Like, what are like the different sort of sides that you have mm -hmm. to the audio programmer as well? Yeah. So, so once again, an unusual story. The way that it started out was uh, in 2017, I was finishing my second year at university, and I was panicking that I wasn't going to be able to find a job when I graduated. And right. So I was looking for job techs of programmers, and I noticed a lot of them were mentioning the Juice framework and C++, and we're teaching C++ in, at the university, but maybe not to the level that I thought that I needed to know. And so I had started the YouTube channel at first as a way to discipline myself to continuing to learn and continuing basically push through learning the juice framework. Um, right. So I knew that started if I started a YouTube channel and I made a verbal commitment to everybody that I was going to do this once a week and do this tutorial that I would, out of embarrassment, uh, I would be embarrassed if I wasn't going to be able to keep up with it. So I decided, so I, uh, I did it as a way to just basically discipline myself and, uh, and try to make sure that I stayed consistent in my learning path and pushed through any difficulties and barriers that I had uh, or any excuses that I had to, uh, to learning how to do it. Yeah, that, that yeah, that, that that's quite like the interesting like take on that, and and I think like for many YouTubers or uh, this is something common, right? So especially in the tutorial sort of like side of things and with coding, I know of many YouTubers who basically started by like sharing their um, sort of like learning path, right, with other people, and they would make this tutorials just to show to others like what they can do and what they've learned probably just like a week before, right? And it's it's a very nice way of also like keeping yourself in check, I think, right? So yeah, that that, that that's yeah. quite cool. Yeah, that, one of the ways that uh, one of the things that I anticipated that or that I didn't anticipate beforehand was that I thought that there were going to be a lot of people that were going to be critical of me because I was just starting out. Uh, and these tutorials would normally come from somebody who's been doing this a very long time. But I actually found that people resonated with the way that I was explaining the content because I was explaining it from a beginner's perspective uh -huh. and that so many other people <clears throat> that um, maybe you were explaining it, but I think as you gain expertise, you tend to start explaining things from a technical perspective and, and that you you have these phrases that are used every day within your industry that the average person doesn't know or doesn't understand. And so it's very easy for us to, as uh, once you become a domain expert, to gloss over uh, the, the phrases and the terminology and all of these things. And I found that I was really trying to go down to a base level and trying to explain these concepts in a way that a person who was not even in the industry could understand them. And uh, that resonated with a lot of people. Yeah, I think that this is a really a critical thing to do. And this is a little bit my experience as well. So many people sort of found my tutorials as well like quite simple because my take was from that of a beginner most of the time right and the problem is the the more experts you are sometimes and the more difficult it is to pass information easily and this is something that i have to struggle with like quite a lot right to understand like how to pass the information in the most viable uh, way possible and easier to understand way possible for the learner like on the other end and indeed I know of many stories of great researchers who are not great teachers just because of that because they have so much knowledge packed right that it's sometimes like very difficult for them to to take the the perspective of someone who's not that involved in that specific topic right yeah Absolutely, because the thing is, is that 
I think teaching and being able to relay information is a whole is a whole skill in itself. That's separate even from knowing the knowing the information and being able to convey the information. I think are two completely separate skills, and there uh, and, and I think that there are a lot of people that have a great wealth of knowledge, but their ability to convey that information to others. Uh, sometimes sometimes suffers in that because it's another uh, it's another skill it's a whole different skill yeah I totally agree uh, so one thing that I'm really curious about is of course the audio programmer is a great YouTube channel and you have a lot of learning material for beginners and intermediate and even expert um, programmers audio programmers but the cool thing that really inspired me a lot was the community that you built behind uh, the YouTube channel. Can you just like guide me a little bit through like that? So what's the community behind it? So what does it look like at this point? And how did you build it? Yeah, well, the way I think a great way to build relationships with anybody is to have the ability to give people things with necessarily wanting anything in return uh, right. and that's really what I was doing with the audio programmer and that's and I really think about that just even more broadly in terms of life just thinking about um, the the one of the greatest feelings to me is the ability to be able to give somebody something whether it's whether it's money whether it's uh, resources whether it's knowledge and just being able to do that and to truly not have any expectations in return, not expect anything back. Uh, and that, that to me is a, is a sign of strength. Uh, and so when I did the YouTube channel, uh, a lot of people, I think when they, when they start these new endeavors, they really think about, well, how am I going to monetize this or what's in it for me? How is this going to pay me back? And they think of these things in these very, tangible and, in my opinion, two-dimensional types of ways. Uh, I really try, I really try to think, think, I really try to flip it over and think, how can I give away the most possible without expecting anything in return? Um, <clears throat> and that's really what, that's really what started the community. The community, the, the community by accident, when I did these tutorials, uh, I was, I was really just doing them as a way to teach myself and to help kind of spread the knowledge because there was no there at the time there were no resources for any of this aside from some tutorials on the Juice YouTube page, uh, and um, I was really just thinking, okay, this is really to learn myself and to and for people if they follow along on this on a similar journey then mm -hmm. uh then i'll leave a trail for them to follow basically uh <clears throat> and so i didn't anticipate that it was going to grow into a whole community because uh when i first started it's difficult when it's difficult when you do your first couple videos and they're five viewers or ten viewers <laughs> and nobody's interested nobody cares about what you're doing it's a very niche it's a it's it's an extremely niche topic that not many people in the world know about. And uh, you really have to have the core faith in what you're doing. And, and that's really where you've got to, that's really where you've got to tighten down and just really remember the purpose why you did it in the first place. Um, but <clears throat> over time, and uh, this is over the course of six months, eight months, a year, people started gravitating towards this and saying, wow, this is really this is a really amazing resource. I really love the way that you're explaining this. Uh, please don't stop doing these tutorials. And uh, people start asking questions, and there were questions that I wasn't even, uh, that I didn't know, which kind of spurred me to get along with my development and find out these answers. But then um, I just thought, there needs to be a central point where people can ask each other these questions because uh, maybe people, maybe somebody knows a piece of knowledge that they could just pass on to another person, and uh, we needed a mutual place for that. And it started out actually on Telegram, uh, but then Telegram didn't didn't scale too well, 
Uh, so, so we quickly moved it over to Discord, and not many people at the time knew, uh, knew about Discord. It wasn't the platform that everybody seems to know about now. And, um, and yeah, it just started there, and it just started kind of snowballing. Uh, and during that time, I think what happens is when, when a community grows, it really has to, it's, it's really important for fundamentals to be in place, right? So it has to be, it has to be a safe, it is important. For me, the most important things were that it needs to be a place where a person, no matter where they come from, no matter how much experience they have, can come in and they can feel like they're welcome and that they, uh, and that they, they're able to ask a question without uh, without feeling ridiculed or feeling like the yeah. the, the level is it is uh, too far beyond them because I, I I saw that in other on other platforms where people just felt intimidated about asking even you know, the most basic questions uh, and it was nice it was quite nice that I was on that basic level myself so I thought <laughs> I want to make this I want to make this in place where I could come in and I could ask my basic questions and I want other people to feel like that as well. So that's really where that felt, where, uh, because there are so many people that join our community that say, wow, this is this is the most welcoming and the most on task community that I've ever been a part of. Uh, a lot of other a lot of other communities posting memes and they're posting all of this content that is not really relevant to the task at hand. You know, but I think that you find when people come into our Discord, there's this tone of, uh, okay, we're here to talk about audio programming, or we're here to talk about becoming better developers, and uh, and you're welcome no matter where, no matter what your background, uh, and and that is a place for anybody to come and ask questions, and no question is too below us to to answer. Yeah, that, that's super cool. And some of this story sort of reminds me a lot of what happened with the Sound of AI community as well. So at some point, uh, like I was receiving a lot of comments uh, below like my um, videos and I thought, well, I really don't have enough time also to address all of this. Uh, questions, right? So people asking me specific things about a video that perhaps, I don't know, like I published five months ago, one year ago. And so that was like very difficult for me like to keep track of all of that. Uh, plus I saw the sort of like in, in involvement in the process and I thought also for the Sound of AI community that or the Sound of AI channel that it would be nice to have a community, a safe community, as you said, where people can just like share their passion in in our case for artificial intelligence applied to audio music sound uh, more in general. But yeah, I think like it's a very similar path. So in my experience, I had a lot of nice surprises from the community, from the members, things like that I didn't expect, like they would say, they would do, or they would push for. So are there particular things that surprised you, uh, like coming from the community members? Um, I, think, I think I get surprises all the time in that, uh, one one thing that I've learned that finding opportunity, finding opportunities in this industry, or maybe even in life in general, is very much about opening yourself up for connection and opening yourself up to the maximum amount of kind of I don't want connection opportunities, but you 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 basically have to open yourself up right. and allow people to. So there's a bit of vulnerability there. Um, and I found that the that's really what the audio programmer did uh, for me as a person, for me as a person in this industry, is that it opened up a lot of communication channels where people were were asking and interacting with me about all different types of things. Uh, and it actually took a while to really, it was so much that I had to really pick and choose and say, okay, this is what I'm going to focus on, and I'm going to have to put this over to the side right now, and this is, and I'm going to have to find a solution for these types of inquiries at a later point. Um, 
and that's where these things started turning into business models. Um, but the the thing is, is that uh, yeah, there, there are people that inquire about all different types of stuff. Uh, I mean, we've uh, I've had conversations with uh, you know some of the biggest companies in the world just about uh, about different opportunities. So all of that has been a very very big surprise. Yeah. Yeah, th that's really cool because once again, like this is something like that has happened to me as well. So creating these opportunities or creating these uh, conversations with uh, companies or like people in the space that you wouldn't think you could reach, but that actually happens, right? I think like this is like something very important for uh, all the people who are like listening to us like today or like following. Uh, that you want to build like your own channels you want to sort of like it's not just like about like promoting promoting yourself but like being useful for the community and by doing so in a sense you're gonna get back from the wider community and there you also will have business opportunities so yeah i think like that's definitely like something like to, to keep in mind so guys uh if you want like to create a channel the next the audio programmer like you should definitely like start doing that because it really really pays off and it, it it's a lot of it's a big satisfaction like the, the whole process i would say but particularly yeah. speaking but, about but, like sorry go ahead i was going to sorry to interrupt you i was going to i was going to say there is a caveat uh i think i think more than anything, I think one thing that I've learned about this is to know and understand yourself, understand where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are, uh, right. and that use that to leverage who you are as a person in any industry. Um, so, for for my for my particular situation, it happened to be because of my love of talking to people and love of connecting people, love of uh, helping people to learn things, um, love of love of teaching uh, and facilitating is that is that personal thing that has made the audio programmer into what it is there. You know, uh, a lot of I think what happens is that I find that a lot of other people a, a lot of people feel that they want to try to follow the same path or follow the path that you found. You know, like we have, we have two similar threads, a lot of similar, a lot of similar stories and everything. But the audio, the audio programmer is its own story, and the sound of AI is its own story. And if another person starts their YouTube page or starts their um, their initiative, right? So I say initiative because. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not a YouTube page, right? So maybe of course. Say, but I get very nervous uh, talking to people and putting and putting and, and doing tutorial videos, and that's okay as well, right? It's important. I think it's important to acknowledge that and to recognize that and say, okay, well, maybe a YouTube channel isn't for me, right? Uh, maybe building a community isn't for me, uh, and. And then trying to figure out, well, what are my strengths? What are the things that I'm good at? Um, and how can I utilize those talents, right? So if you're yeah. a very strong, if you're a really strong developer, it might be written content and it might be taking your code and posting it on GitHub and then doing, and then doing written, long, long written content that explains the code that you're doing. Um, so I think it's really important to think about to think about who you are as a person and then use these tools to really to, to, to really help you emphasize those things rather than trying to maybe be somebody or not. Nobody's asking you to be somebody or not. Just use the tools that are available to you to try to emphasize the talents that you're best at. So um, that would be my advice for for other people that are looking to get into this space that's cool great great advice so i'm curious to know where do you see the audio programmer say like in two years or five years from now mm. that's a great question uh one thing that one thing that we decided to do was like i said we we uh 
originally things started off with a lot of different types of inquiries coming in from a lot of places. Uh, one person wanted to build an iOS app that uses the use machine learning. Another person wants to build a plugin, uh, a plugin with Juice. Um, you know, those are two very different types of problems to to confront, right? And yeah. what I found is that when people try to tackle all of that, it's too much to tackle. Uh, you know, even in the, and and we're we're involved in the recruitment space as well. You know, once again you can get very caught up in trying to trying to get your arms around this massive beast of a problem and uh, what I, what i found is that you at some point you have to draw a line well at first you just take any query that comes in right because sure. you're trying to make everything financially sustainable yeah. but there's a point where you have to draw a line and you and sometimes it's very difficult where you have to say this is the type of thing that I do, and this is the type of thing that I could do maybe if I concentrated it on it, but I just don't have the bandwidth to actually to, to actually deal with this. Um, and I think that's important as a developer as well to to really think about well, what are the things that I want to concentrate on? What are the things that maybe I could turn my hand to, but maybe they aren't for me right now. Uh, <clears throat> and um, and that's. In terms of where the audio programmer is going, so so we have a development agency that involves um, graphic designers, product managers, uh, software developers, and everything in between. <clears throat> and we had to really decide what are the types of projects that we're going to develop on, and which type of projects are we going to say, you know what, that's that's not really our specialty. Uh, so, so with that, we wanted to, we decided to slim it down to real-time audio space. So digital signal processing in real-time, audio plugins, audio app, uh, maybe audio applications, but mostly audio, mostly audio plugins. Um, and deciding to go and deciding to focus on that space because everything else was just too, a little bit too much to tackle and, and required us to get a little bit too far out of our comfort zone to really, um, to, to, to really try to try to deal with effectively. Uh, then on, on the recruitment and contracting space, once again, very focused on uh, people, people who want to make audio plugins uh, and that work in this real time audio space. We would take, we would take inquiries from from other companies, and we would, and and I would find that when we got out of our comfort zone, it was just, it was just too difficult. It felt like a reach to try to satisfy what they were looking for. So, right. we, so we decided to, uh, to really just, to, to really just figure out, well, who are we? Uh, <clears throat> and then the other, the other thing with, so, so, that was, that's one of the things in terms of where the audio programmer is going is just really. Becoming becoming experts in this particular niche, becoming the expert in this particular niche, but not not really trying to reach too far outside of our particular expertise. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, in terms of the community, enhancing enhancing the way that that people learn, um, giving other people the opportunity to to teach and to um, and to present their work that's what we've done with the monthly meetup but uh, there are other ways as well uh, trying to help incentivize them as well to uh, to actually contribute content and to make this into more of a of a platform for people to uh, share information uh, rather than uh, one kind of beginner slash intermediate software developer trying their best to work navigate through juice tutorials. <laughs> <laughs> so making it a little bit more community, uh, giving the community more of an opportunity to actually make contributions and to show show their work. I think that's a fantastic way to um, just just keep things going and to keep the spirit of what the audio programmer is at, at its core, which is community. That's cool. That's very interesting take. So when you start having too many requests 
try to just stick with your focus instead of going around across like all different things because you want to, I don't know, perhaps get more stable, like, well, you want to get like more stable financially and everything, but once you are past that initial problem, then just like stick with your like core things. So yeah, that's quite cool. In in your answer, you also quickly mentioned one thing. That's one of the, the things, like that, one of the services that the audio programmer offers right now, which is recruitment services, right? So hiring people for uh, third companies, right? Specifically audio programmers or audio DSP people. Mm -hmm. so can you just like explain how that works? Yeah. So we were lucky. We were lucky enough to be in a position where, as the community was growing, uh, companies would begin to come to us, and they would say, uh, "Do you happen to know any audio developers who fit this particular skill set?" Uh, and it just so happened in the beginning that I did, and I was like, "Yeah, I have a friend that's able to do this." And um, I've, I've, I felt that this was quite rewarding because the ability to be a catalyst in a situation where a person is able to provide means to uh, to make to, to to pay their bills, to make ends meet, to uh, to progress in life is to me is one of the most rewarding things I think that I've had since I've since I've started this venture. The opportunity to say, well, we could help you progress your career. Um, with with this new opportunity and, and open new doors for you, uh, and that that was really where it came from. Uh, and luckily, I think that we've earned a nice reputation through that. That all of our inquiries have been inbound, so we don't actually go uh, to companies and say, "Oh, are you looking for recruiting? Are you looking for? Yeah. Uh, do you want us to help you?" I don't really I don't really believe in that. Really, as a as a strategy um, you know, for for that or for our agency, because uh, and I think and, and I think this is another common thing that I see, which is that many times what people do is I think they try to diagnose a problem before they've really had an understanding of the situation. So, mm -hmm. uh, so for instance reaching out about recruiting and about those things before you even be, before people even have an understanding of what is it that the that this company does what do they what do they focus on what do they think is important to them uh, I think is something that I see a lot of and um, you know it's it's it one of our one of our core value it goes into one of my core values for the that I've set out for the company which is serving before selling so uh, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of companies in general, they try to approach these things as though they're selling a product. Uh, I try to encourage an interaction that's more about two people or two parties sitting on the same side of the table, looking inward at a common problem and seeing if they can help solve it rather than uh, I, I think when it gets into a selling type of scenario, then what happens is that it becomes a little bit adversarial because then it becomes about money, and it becomes mm -hmm. about oh, do you want to pay? Do you want to pay? Uh, you know, we normally charge X percent as a commission for our services. Then the other person says, well, can you do lower? And it becomes this battle. It becomes about the percentage. I don't think that. Uh, whereas I think if it was focused on solving the problem. In, in my experience, the the money part is a small part because because then it's because then it's about well Josh really understands my problem he, he really understands what I'm trying to solve here and what I'm trying to accomplish and because he understands my vision now um, you know the money the, the 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 financial aspect of it just becomes extremely natural and it and just becomes kind of a byproduct. You know, it's really the understanding that I think companies need to do rather than the selling of services. So um, so that's one thing that that has been a core of what we're doing with the audio programming. Yeah, that's cool. Very interesting take. But 
how do you reach out to uh, the audio programmers that you recruit? Do you have a sort of dynamic pool and you know them uh, even personally or do you like search them in other manners? Uh, well, we well, it start it started out by just doing just just essentially trying to give. So so trying to trying to do things that provide value to others. Right. That's really where the folk that uh, and, and more than anything, that's where the focus has always been in, you know, what, how do we actually how do we actually take our core skills and how do we actually I, I don't want to get very abstract and kind of hippie and say make the world better but you know mm -hmm. how can we make a contribution to this industry by um by providing value because it's because it's it's been very much about trying to give something rather than trying to funnel somebody into a scenario where they're forced to see a lot of these things are very um are very manipulative uh, that I see. Yeah. That what they'll do is they'll say, they will say something like, um, you know, I have this free ebook. Give me your e, give me your email, and and then once you give in your email, now they're trying to sell you all of these add-ons to try to to try to get you to buy into something. And once again, it gets back to that financial mm -hmm. financial aspect. Whereas what if I told you, oh, you can sign up, you, you can uh, you can watch this meetup. There's no there's no sign up at all. You know, there's you know, it's just you can view it, you can take it or leave it basically. But but I'm going to provide this thing that normally people would charge you money for. I'm going to give it to you for free. You know, but not not in an effort to get you into a funnel, but just truly from the heart to um, to build something that's really cool. And I think that people see that, and I think that people say, "Okay, you know, I want to be a part of that. You know, I want to be a part. I want to be a part of something where, uh, where, where this entity is trying to give something back, rather than trying to, once again, give something, but with expectation, right? Because yeah. like I was saying at the beginning." Um, so if you can learn to give without expectation, without expecting something in return, what you find is that it has, an, it actually has, call it karma, call it whatever you want. It has this exponential effect where uh, through goodwill, through reputation, through word of mouth, what, whatever, whatever it is, I don't even know. I, I don't even know what it is exactly. I just know that when when you're able to give, it just radiates. Uh, and it radiates in an exponential way, and it radiates in a way that is more than what you can uh, that, that can be just tangibly calculated. Uh, and that that's essentially what we do. We we do the way that we grow the community is um, we might you know encounter an audio developer, whether it's on LinkedIn or whether it's on um, I don't know YouTube, wherever, and we say, uh, come to the next, you know, check out our next meetup. It's, uh, you know, Valerio is, is going to be talking about AI. And that person may say, whoa, that sounds really interesting. I want to check that out. They come, they check out the, the meetup, and they say, wow, I really like this. I really like the atmosphere here. It's very welcoming. Yeah. Uh, they're not asking. They're not trying to pull us into a funnel to sell, to sell a course, to sell an e-book. Um, I want to be a part of this. Uh, and then they join the community. And now they're in the community. Once again, you're not you're not sitting there offering. You're, you're not sitting there uh, trying to get them to buy in. Trying to get people to buy into anything. Uh, you're just you're just trying to have a central space where you're giving value to others. And then um, the recruitment plays really well into that scenario because. Then I can say, Valerio, I know that you've been uh, working in the machine learning industry for X amount of years. Uh, I happen to have this opportunity with Company X uh, that has a, that, that's looking for a skill set that's exactly like the skill set that you have. Now I don't know if you're looking for a job or if you're yeah. or if you're happy where you are, but then that becomes a very natural conversation. You know that that to me 
is much better than, hi, my name is Josh. I'm a recruiter. <laughs> I'm a recruiter. Um, you know, in the audio, in the in the audio industry, and I want to tell you, I want to tell you about this because I looked at your LinkedIn profile. Your first reaction is going to be like, you don't know me. You don't know me. You don't know if I'm looking for a job. You don't know. You don't know the the scenario. Um, you know, you, once again, it's that it's that situation where you're trying to diagnose the problem before you even develop, before you've even developed developed any type of relationship or anything, right? You know? When you walk into a doctor's office, does the person just like grab grab your arm and start like putting a cast on it? It's like no, they they say, well, what you know, well, what hurts? Where does it hurt? How long has it been hurting for? Right before they try to, yeah. Where they try to like prescribe some medication, right? It's like people are trying to put themselves out there so much, but what they need to do is they need to step back and they need to listen more, rather than trying to trying to push their services. It's just step back and try to listen, try to listen more. And when you and and when you listen, people will tell you. People will tell you where it hurts. People will tell you, as a company what what the pain is and and then it becomes a very natural conversation to say <clears throat> oh your pain's your pain's there your pain is in recruitment you know you're you're trying to find um you're trying to find audio developers and you're having difficulty connecting with them well i could help you with that pain and then once again once you once you're able to have that conversation then all of the other things the money and all of that and the and the terms and all those things just become natural and they just become, yeah, cool, yeah, no problem. So, um, yeah, I forget what the question was, but I hope I've answered it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that was just spot on. In interesting, very interesting take. And I, and I also agree about like this idea of like giving to people for free. Like, yeah, I think like also, it it it's it sort of connected with this idea of having a. Uh, like open source approach, like to to what you do and sharing knowledge, right? Yeah. Well, well, it's open. It's it's open source, but it's open source it, like more than open source because free free could be crap, right? It could be crap. Yeah. It's free, but it has to have something that's useful. Like when is something that you could normally charge money for, and you're giving yeah. it away from for, for free? That's value there, right? Yeah. That's something that you know, and what I think. With the audio programmer is, you know, we've had we've had people. I, I wish that I, I wish there were a way to measure this or to like get some data on this. Of course, there isn't. But, um, you know, we've had people that have gone from start to industry release app just through the tutorials, just through the resources that we've done, the resources we've pointed them to, all of those things. I mean, what's more valuable than that, right? Yeah. Um, you know all of that so it's like it's not just you know some some people once again it's, it's trying to focus on the right recipe there it's not just about giving things away for free it's about giving things away for free that have that that are useful to people right that um that that's the key there yeah yeah i think like that's really really spot on and Talking about like useful things for people. So there are many uh, people in the sound of AI who are really into AI, music sound and things like that, but not necessarily into audio programming. So the sort of like juice mm. framework or like a, a DSP, core DSP, things like that. So what would you suggest them to get started in that space apart from checking out your amazing tutorials on the audio programmer? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, so so we have a bunch of tutorials. I think that Juice, the Juice as a company and as a framework have really stepped up their tutorial game. Uh, uh -huh. They have loads of tutorials on their page. Also, the Juice forum is, uh, is very welcoming as well in terms of uh, people, if they're looking to ask questions, um, that's, that's also a place we have... Um, the audio developer conference, uh, ABC, which I've uh, I've been a part of for since since 2018, and uh, that's another resource where uh, where you're able to find uh, a number of, of topics and uh, a number of discussions on things that normally wouldn't be shared within the industry. So you have 
you know, keep it from Isa to talking about the their work in machine in machine learning and yeah. and um, you know people from uh, you know all companies all around the world that are that are sharing their uh, that, are, that are sharing their work and sharing their research. Uh, so you can you can find that on the juice um, on the juice YouTube page. They have a whole bunch of ADC talks. I think they have probably over a hundred talks. Uh, cool. Are from industry leaders, so people who are ex domain experts in in this um, giving talks, and so uh, so you have that. You have some great books that are out there. Uh, Will Purple uh, has uh, some great books. He just came out with a second edition of a book called Designing Audio Effects in C++ that is really good. Um, he also has a synthesizer book that uh, that's really good. That uh, there's um, Eric Tarr, who's a professor at Belmont University. He has some great resources. He has a book called Half Audio that's written in MATLAB that uh, goes through. You don't even have to have any programming experience. It'll help take you from kind of beginner to making DSP, uh, making simple DSP effects. Uh, so that's another one. Uh, Max MSP have some great have some great books. Um, there are two um, Italian authors that have created three books on designing audio effects uh, in Max MSP. And they're they're fantastic. Uh, and uh, Maurizio Giri is one of them. I forget the other person's name. Um, so, th yeah, it's it's out there. A lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff is out there. Uh, I think earlevel.com is is another good. Uh, I think that's still going. Um, yeah, there are some there are some uh, there are some nice resources out there. I think for you just have to know where to look. I think. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, there's uh, Matthew that's saying that there is a new Python version of Hack Audio too. Yeah, that's right. So, so, uh, so Eric Tarr, who's the author of of Hack Audio, was nice enough to open source his MATLAB implementations of the of all the items that he discussed in the book, and there is we actually did Python conversions of those. Uh huh. So, that's cool. That's yeah, cool. So that. Uh, People that aren't aware, MATLAB and Python share uh, a lot of the same characteristics. So, um, yeah, he was nice enough to do Python implementations of all these. So, big up to her. And talking about programming languages, Maddy is asking, what's your, I would assume, favorite programming language or framework? Yeah, so, so traditionally it's been C++ for me, right. uh, just because that has been the uh, lingua franca for for real time audio software development. However, uh, I will I will say that um, JavaScript is starting to make a uh, is starting to make a real run here. Uh, there are a lot of um, there's a lot of talk about using JavaScript now as a UI, UI layer um, for, uh, while while using C uh, for the real-time processing, having JavaScript uh, for the UI side, so there have been a couple of great projects for that, uh, such as uh, React Juice from Nick Thompson, and that. Uh, and speaking of Nick Thompson, he's actually come out with a real-time audio uh, library called Elementary, which is hmm. fully JavaScript, uh, and so web developers, or if you have experience in JavaScript. Uh, he's he's made a pretty compelling case for being able to write audio plugins using JavaScript. Uh, so it's still in development, but um, he has a budding community that's that's doing really well, and he has tutorials. So there's it's a really exciting space. I think JavaScript uh, I think JavaScript has a lot of potential. Um, I find JavaScript to be very confusing coming from a C++ background myself. Uh, but I really need to dig into it and learn some React and and, and uh. really uh, and really just 
get my hands dirty with it. But it's I find Java because C plus plus, it's it's like a uh, you know it's one of these things. It's like you know what it is and you know what it isn't, and it it, it feels like it's very rigid, but you know once you get to know it, you can work with it. JavaScript almost feels like anything can be anything. Yeah, you know, it feels very, in, in my head, it feels very abstract and it feels like, well, I could just plug this thing into this thing and now this can be, this can become a, fun I can make a function out of this. Uh, and it, it just becomes very um, wishy-washy. Like I feel like right. I, I stand with it. I don't, there's so many frameworks, there's so many libraries, there's so many different ways of working with it. Uh, and whereas with, when it comes to C++, it's like you have this library and that's that's all you have to work with. <laughs> right. Yeah, I understand. Have you ever tried Python? Because, I mean, yeah. it's putting everything into everything, yeah. being like quite messy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have some experience. I have some experience with Python. Python is a bit like that as well, where it is. Yeah, just, it is. <laughs> to another thing, it's, it's a little bit, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, so it's so flexible, but people love that, don't they? They love the flexibility of it. Uh, yeah, I like. Uh, yeah, I think with C plus plus, it's like I like structure, I like rigidity, um, I embrace it. Uh, and whereas uh, maybe I need to get a little bit more flexible with my <laughs> development skills. Cool. So, uh, just to follow up on your comment regarding like uh, JavaScript and uh, elementary, if I remember correctly, right? Uh, so, I just wanted to ask you like, what's hot in audio programming like right now? So, what do you think like are the main things that are driving the field forward? Yeah, I think I think uh, once again this idea of incorporating JavaScript into at least the UI aspect of creating. Uh, of creating audio apps, audio plugins is something that's very interesting and in a in a in a very interesting space. Uh, the main benefit of that is being able to circumvent large uh, long compile times and uh, and increase the rapidity, increase your iterations uh, over a period of time, you know, uh, speed up your workflow. So there are a lot of advantages to that. Uh, I think as well in terms of um, in terms of just what's hot in the audio audio software space. I think as many people know that there is a lot of work into simplifying workflow. Uh, so in the early 2000s and before that, there was all of this work about I want to be able to have audio devices and plugins and hardware that's able to do everything so it became very general purpose and something that uh, and that's what I think people were looking for from software before but I think now the move uh, of course kind of spearheaded by uh, things like arcade by output things like that is now more about um, having character basically you know having character um, having maybe a, a workflow and understanding that that workflow may work for some people and may not work for other people. Um, having plugins that may only have two or three parameters, but those those parameters that you adjust may be really interesting. Uh, I think, uh, of course, ML is also a very active space. So these things like source separation, like um, Kind of aid, quote unquote, aids for your uh, and and, and uh, to to help your your workflow along. Coming up with interesting MIDI, uh, interesting chord progressions. Coming up with interesting ideas uh, and having the help of ML. I think a lot of. I, I mean, you would know more about this than me, of course, but you know, I think that the views from some people maybe a little bit idealistic in terms of what can be achieved, uh, it's possible. But at the same time, there are a lot of things just within the creative industry that I think are really, um, really compelling. And if they can be transferred into the, in, into our audio industry, I think they're, I think 
they're pretty awesome. Stuff like style transfer and, uh, and, and things like that. If we can find some really clever ways to, to, to implement to implement that and get that into our workflow and taking something that's in one style and converting it to a, into another style. I don't know. I think those, I, I think those things sound really interesting. It's just when you see um, the map of San Francisco in the style of Rome or sure. vice versa, I just think, wow, that's, that's really, that's really incredible. What's the audio equivalent of that? Right. Um, you know, Calvin Harris in classical style. <laughs> I don't know. So, um, yeah, there, there, there's still a lot of interesting space, I think, there. But, uh, but I think source separation is one that, that people are really diving into quite seriously. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem that hasn't quite, there, there have been some good advances, but I think there's still a lot to be done there. Yeah, and I was curious to hear a little bit more about, like, what do you think uh, AI can be used in terms of like audio plugins? So how it could like actually be used beyond like source separation or like style transfer? Like if you have any ideas and your take on what audio programmers think about yeah. machine learning, right? So do you, do you think there's going to be a sort of transitioning of many audio programmers towards uh, machine learning powered Uh, plugins, or do you think these two tracks are going to remain separate? So traditional audio programming on the one hand, and then um, AI applications on the other. Yeah, I think that I think that one thing that's happening is that these things are becoming. I, I think just through the just through the amount of resources and the amount of discussions on these things that there that things that used to be extremely extremely difficult or very niche and very hard very difficult to attain the knowledge to do are now becoming a bit easier and because they're becoming easier then what's happening is that the problem that then it helps us to move on to problems that are a little bit more difficult so for example i don't even think that it was extremely widely known how to make a juice plugin a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, things like the UI, what you're doing with the UI should not affect uh, what is happening underneath with your data processing and with your number crunching and your DSP and things like that. I think these things, maybe it's because I've been in the industry now for a couple of years, but I feel like these types of items are starting to become more widely known and more, more widely seen as okay these are just fundamental items that people know a couple of years ago you would have to know somebody to in order to know certain types of information um but as you do that then it becomes okay so now i know how to make now i know how to make a basic plugin using juice now i can think about more difficult problems and i think when 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 you start to do that that's when then then it becomes um then it was okay well How do I make a delay? How do I make a how do I make a distortion? Uh, what's a good what's a good reverb algorithm? Uh, these these were the questions, you know, kind of higher abstractions, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that is a problem that is now widely starting to get solved. Like if you want to if you want to write your own reverb algorithm or you want to learn how to do it, you know, we have a talk on our channel with somebody that talks how to, how to do it, discusses how to do it from start to end. Um, so the learning is still, uh, I, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Um, I think these, these are problems that are, especially when we start talking about music information retrieval um, and things around, around that space, these are problems that, are not, that, that people are not going to stop thinking about, uh, yeah. that, that, that people are going to continue to research and continue to drive forward so uh, there have been people that have said that they thought that machine learning was was going to go away if anything i think that it's going to become more of a part of uh, of what we do with audio and, and how we create music in the future yeah i couldn't agree more on this i think the two things so the audio programming and the ai machine learning like parts are going to 
sort of like find uh, new synergies and work together for sure. I also think though that there are still some barriers in the space, especially if you want to work with like C++, right, or Juice. Like having a Python trained model run into C++ is still quite the problem. Yes, there are a few frameworks like RT Network, right, for example, that you can use, but it's still a big hassle to do like that sort of like porting from Python to, uh, to C++. And I think though that in the future we'll see that uh, tools to facilitate this porting, this processes are gonna just like appear. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So we, we, we have an inter interesting question from Matthew who's asking where would you say a majority of audio programmer industry positions are located? Is that the UK, Europe in general, or San Francisco, so the US? So I would say that uh, Typically, it starts with the big three, which is the U.S., the U.K., and Germany. Uh, uh -huh. But I think now, especially with people being more open to remote working and, yeah. and these things, and also um, just just um, tax regulations and, and yeah. things like that, that companies are now really open to working with fully distributed teams. Uh, that are in vastly different locations. So I think that's going to open up a lot more. There's, there's really no motivation that I can really see other than proximity, uh, proximity to other companies and proximity to other, uh, yeah, proximity to other companies that why would you want to set up your company in San Francisco, for instance? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there was, there was a, there was a point where, yeah, you know, I, I think. I think the main advantage that maybe they had for the bigger companies was that you had the proximity to Stanford, Stanford hmm. University, and some some key universities there that were uh, that that they were able to do talent acquisition. But I think that now, especially for experienced audio developers, they are open. Like right now, I'm in Florida. There, uh, you know, you have a lot of people that are moving out this way because of the tax benefits and because sunny, um, and because of the cost of living, and because of that, uh, I find that it's it's very difficult for companies to make a compelling case that you need to ride the train into central London every day to be in an office. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think like that's. Spot on uh, once again, and in my experience as well, like hiring for companies, AI music talent. Uh, after COVID, I've seen that many, many of these positions were actually remote. Before COVID, there was this sort of like idea or almost dogma that you have to go to work to an official and physical place. But right now, this is no longer felt as a, as a need which basically need, means that like many people can just work remote, do their things like in the place that they find uh, like the, the most compelling for their uh, needs, be that weather, be that leisure, be that whatever, like lifestyle they want, want to have. And I think like uh, Matthew was also asking like whether like there's a difference between like AI music positions and audio like programming positions. I think in the case of AI music positions, what I've seen is that also many companies from Australia as well as like the, the Far East are hiring people. And in these cases, I've noted that they want to attract uh, like top talent. And most of the time, this top talent is located in Europe and the US, mm -hmm. which basically force them to open up even more to remote uh, positions. But as you said, uh, Josh, there, I think like earlier, there was this idea that you have to be in the place where like the, the, the top talent is, I mean, San Francisco, Silicon Valley for Stanford or for Berkeley, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But right now, given this sort of like uh, open approach, so you, you, can, you can open yourself up to the entire talent, AI music talent or audio programming talent across the world and there are no barriers really, apart from time zones that sometimes can still be a barrier, but there are nice workarounds mm. in that as well. Yeah, I think, I think that uh, as well, what, what's important for companies to realize is that when you have a developer that 
has a lot of experience. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know your experience, but my experience has been that uh, they they are very reluctant to uh, because they they think you know what I've got offers coming in from other companies uh, that don't need me to move. Uh, and, and a lot of times, money isn't really the factor. You know? No, not at all. A lot of a lot of companies think that they can just throw money at the problem, but uh, sometimes there's no amount of money that's going to get that person to move from their comfortable lifestyle in a chateau in France uh, to the busy streets of New York or London. Um, you know, it's, it's just the Quality of life, I think, is so important. I think it's such a key focus right now for people, uh, and um, yeah, I, I can't see that changing anytime soon. Yeah, absolutely. And other drivers that I've seen there is so, how much can I learn in this company, right? That that I want to join. It's not really about money. It's more about the sort of like learning potential that you have there the independence that you have there and how the the company culture so there should be like a, a good fit so yeah i don't know like if this is something that uh covid amplified and it was there even like before COVID. but definitely right now this is i mean like attention to quality of life attention to like being in a place where you really enjoy and being Mm. and uh, like joining companies but because you really like them not just because i mean like that's the thing to do to earn a living uh yeah. are things that have happened i think that this was something that was pre-covid in my experience and what i was and what i was seeing so a lot of people think that that covid really brought on these these uh, uh these things but i found that they just more than anything, it just brought them to the forefront. People, yes. Uh, experience, experience developer for experienced developers, it was very difficult to get them to want to relocate to uh, to another country, to another city, uh, and there were there were already a number of companies that were starting to think into the future with having a fully distributed, fully remote team, and. I think it makes a lot of sense uh, for for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, one of which is that if you can if you can get the best if you can get the best person for for the job, and that person happens to live in Idaho or happens to live in um, you know, just out in the middle of out in the middle of nowhere, um, yeah. you know, I want that person on my team. I don't I don't want the it, you know, I want to try to find the best, the best fits for our team, not the best fits for our team that just happened to be within a 50 mile radius. Yes. So, so uh, yeah, I think I think that it just opens up things for a lot of uh, you know, a new way of living, even you know, just a new way. You know, I don't want to say a new society, but just um, yeah, a new way. Uh, a new way of interacting with your occupation. Cool. Okay, Josh, I think like this was an amazing, amazing chat and I'm sure like that everyone really enjoyed it, but uh, we could like continue like for hours, I guess, like here, but I would just like cut it like on this note. And, uh, and I just want to thank you once again like, for being here on the Conversations on the Sound of AI channel. And I just wish you like best of luck for the future of the audio programmer and uh, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. And if there's any way I can help, just get in touch anytime. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Right, take take care. Bye-bye. Care. And we are off.